Welcome, you guys, to my studio. Um, this is a supplementary, supplementary? This is a supplement video for classes since we can't be at the high school right now. Um, I thought it'd be a great time to actually spend some time in my studio since kind of the school for a lot of us is our satellite studio. So it'd be kind of a cool time to show you guys some of the supplies I use, the materials I use that I don't get to bring in all the time. Um, and then when we get back into class, you'll have a wide knowledge base of how we can use the materials we have at our school, right, for our own projects. Um, so today, I know I promised like right before we went on this extended break, we we're going to get into painting. Uh, not all of you have those supplies at home. You don't have, you know, the brushes, let alone the paints and the canvases. Um, some of you do. And you, I mean, I encourage you use that, spend this time locked up. It's just like an artist's dream. You're stuck in the same place. You've got just create, right? Um, we don't all have that at home. So I'm going to, as far as, you know, at home work that you could do, again, nothing's mandatory, but you could do, I'll post some of those references I talked about earlier, like master copies. Um, we can do just to practice our drawing skill. Most of them will be drawing based because we all have pencils and paper or pen, or we can get a hold of them. Um, we can definitely do that at home. So I'll post some of that stuff and we'll do some even step-by-step uh, -step, or I'll do some demonstrations of that. Uh, but today I thought it'd be kind of cool since this is a studio art class to dive into a lot of the stuff around my studio um, and then how we can apply it to your stuff at our studio at the school. Um, mainly starting with brushes. We used brushes last semester. Sorry, I keep looking over here. We got all the, I got all the brushes set up. Um, and then I'll use this kind of tabletop view, put it on the screen, um, to show you kind of an overhead view of a little bit easier to go through it. Okay, the anatomy of a brush, right? We have the handle, we have the furl, and we have the hair or the bristles. Okay, now the most obvious difference between most brushes is the handle length, right? We've got everything from this extra long brush to kind of more standard size long brushes and then smaller size brushes. Um, for oil painting, which we're going to be moving into when we get back into class, we kind of stick with like your standard long handle brush. The smaller brushes uh, handled brushes are more for what comes to mind would be watercolor or things where you have to stand pretty close to and over your paper and kind of watch it all evolve. Uh, the benefit of a long handled brush is you don't have to grip it more like a pencil, but you can stand further back from it like this. Uh, keep the whole canvas in view, especially when you get into your huge canvases, you know, four by six by eight feet. You want to stand as far back as possible, kind of really extend the arm all the way out so you keep as much proportional accuracy as possible. We're not going to be working on that big of canvases, but this would kind of be the standard thing for something that size. Uh, we're going to be using these more long-handled brushes and um, stay away from these small ones. But that's kind of the biggest aesthetic difference, and I think it really is a general um, and personal choice. Right, all of these are kind of my workhorse brushes right here uh, for oil painting. And you can see that they're all short handled. So it's all up to you. Um, I can still kind of hold it way back here and stand back in arm's length if need be. Um, but I kind of just like the feel of it in my hand a little bit better, the weight. I like the portability. I can throw them in like a paper towel tube, throw them in my backpack if I'm traveling and painting. So that's a personal choice. You guys might remember the brushes we used for the most of last semester. Uh, when we were using acrylic paint, we kind of stuck with these synthetic brushes. We have our flat and our filbert. They did a really good job working with acrylic paint. Now that we're moving into oil paint, we're gonna wanna switch up the kind of brush a little bit. We'll still find use for these, uh, but we're gonna need a little bit more of a coarser brush. So that's where these guys come in from the same set we've got our coarser hairs, okay? So aside from the handle, the biggest difference that we're gonna notice in our brush types is the type of hair they have. You know, is it natural, is it synthetic? Which can correlate to the coarseness, or the roughness of the brush, and the softness, or the smoothness of the paint application. Um, 
and how we need that coarseness to actually apply the oil paint. We can get away with the softer synthetic brush with the smooth kind of flowy acrylic paint, but once we get into the heavier body oil painting, after we mix it, we wanna move it from the palette onto the canvas, we're gonna need a little bit more heaviness or heavy handedness with our brush to get those really expressive passages. That's not to say that you can't get a synthetic brush that has coarseness to it, right? We have, you know, animal friendly versions for the animal friendly painter out there. The synthetic hog hair brush, it's all made from a plastic um, filament that, you know, offers the same kind of stiffness and roughness as maybe a natural pig hair would uh, without any detriment to the animal. Same thing over here on the soft side, kind of nylon is the standard, but if we want to move into the natural hair, we get something like a sable or a mongoose kind of hair, which you can see just the difference, the, the delicacy of this hair. Um, hair often reserved for watercolor, um, just because it's so soft and so expensive that you don't want to like damage it with, you know, aggressive use on a canvas texture or the cleaning that goes into a lot of oil painting brushes compared to watercolor brushes. Um, that's not to say that they're not used. I use them all the time. You just have to be a lot more careful with them or they have a very short lifespan. Um, they have made, just like they make natural hair for soft, they've made synthetic versions of sables, right? That come at a quite lower cost point and last a lot longer. Some would argue it doesn't have the exact same handling, um, but I think it gets pretty close to replicating this at a really cheaper price point and it just lasts a lot longer. So we used these last semester. We're gonna be moving into this coarser natural hair for economy reasons. You know, we're gonna stick with the soft nylon because they'll just last a lot longer. They're not gonna get destroyed like a sable. And then the production of fake coarse hair is actually more expensive than just getting the hog hair alone. So we're gonna stick with these bristle brushes. We're also gonna add this fine tip kind of round brush to our arsenal for some smaller detail work. But you know what I say, general to specific, so this will come in in the end when we get into all the eyelashes and stuff like that. Um, let's just review the brush shapes or the shapes of the hairs of the brushes really quick. Remember last semester, we talked about the benefits of using a flat brush versus a filbert brush. Get this name from the nut shape of the filbert nut. The coarse brushes we'll be adding are also gonna be a filbert and a flat and now a round. Um, other shapes that you might see in your art journeys would be the fan shape, named for its fan shape. You'll see things like the flat, but called a bright because it's as wide as it is long. So it's more of a square bristle and they just call it a bright to differentiate it from being longer than it is wide. Um, like the round, if you, get, if you get a very long, long round like this, we call that a rigger. Um, I believe it gets its name from drawing or painting the rigging ropes on a ship. And then if you were to extend kind of this filbert shape to a very long length, we get the Egbert, which I think is named after the artist, not the maker of the brush. And that's about the totality. I guess one last one would be the dagger or the sword, which is really popular in kind of lettering and sign painting, um, calligraphy. Not so much in oil painting per se, but definitely becoming more popular. So that's the shapes, that's the types of hair and what we can get from them. We use the softer synthetics for kind of the more smooth passages and the soft detailed blending work. We're gonna use the coarse natural hair for you know just sheer paint load and getting paint on the canvas and getting nice soft edges. You know how much I emphasize sharp crisp edges versus softer, more fuzzy, um, ambiguous edges, and how that adds a great um, artistic quality to our work. Um, 
and that's gonna be the gist of it. Now, I wanna go into cleaning as well, but first we're gonna get into the types of oil paint versus the starting with acrylic, spot speaking about oil, and then we're, what we're gonna be using, which is gonna be a water mixable oil. And then afterwards, we'll have some dirty brushes that we can clean. All right. So last semester, we used acrylic paint. Remember, we started with whites and our blacks, and we moved into a limited color palette. We're going to kind of do the same thing this time, but we're going to switch to oil paint. Um, there's a few key differences. The main one being, or the main few being, that acrylics, as we remember, dry very quickly. Um, they do have some more open-ended ones that dry slower, and you can add certain mediums. Um, they're called retardants to slow the dry time, but in general, they dry a lot quicker than oil paints, and in my experience, they're more opaque. Again, you can thin them to make them more transparent and get washes and such, but in general, oil paints give you a much wider, out of the tube, ability to move from opaque to transparent. The other big difference is that acrylics can be cleaned up with water. Once they're dry, they are water resistant. But when you're using them and they haven't cured or evaporated and set yet, they are still cleanable through water. Oil paints need solvent or mineral spirits, which can be pretty harsh smelling. Um, so we won't be using paint thinner in the class. We're going to be using water-soluble oil paint. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. We get the beautiful kind of pigment quality and ability to go from opaque to transparent. We get the slow dry time and we get to have it all cleaned up with water. Um, not the best of both worlds. And then you don't get the smelly, harsh, chemically smell of like paint thinner um, or any of the crazy mediums. So I think it'll be good. We'll have the benefits of the blending quality so we can get some nice portraiture done. Um, and we're just going to do a side-by-side -side test right now to kind of show you the difference. So let's start. We're going to look at some just some burnt umber in acrylic. We're going to flip over to this screen now again. One last thing I want to say is that, you know, there's often a key, while we're talking about both kinds of paint right now, we should mention kind of how you can interact them in the same painting. Because uh, once you know that, you have a lot of freedom. Like we can use the benefits of acrylic paint for an underpainting, and then we could do an overpainting in oil paint, which is super um, time saving. And um, if you know what you're going for, uh, you can really kind of cut back on the frustration of waiting for things to dry or painting into wet things and then get a, a mess. Um, most canvases, and we'll get into this later in another video when we talk about substrates and things like that, but most canvases you kind of would buy at the store have this white primer or a gesso on it. And for the longest time, I thought that was just basically a white acrylic paint. But the big difference between the two, they're both very opaque, very white, very absorbent. Um, this is sandable. So if you want to apply multiple coats of this to any kind of board, any kind of canvas, um, even some metals, you can sand it down to get rid of texture with like a fine tooth sandpaper. Um, both can be used, I guess, as a sealant on some of that kind of stuff before going into oil. You know, you never really want to do like oil, this is a palette, but you never want to do, if this was like a final paint surface, like this per se, you don't want to paint on this directly without priming it with something because eventually that oil paint with its acidity will chew through and start to eat away at the wood. I did coat this with a clear version of this. So it dried clear. Um, so that is archival. Um, but that's the big difference between gesso and acrylic. Now what that leads next to is that you can always start with acrylic. You don't want to start with oil on a panel and then do acrylic over the top of it. What happens, so this is an acrylic base, just bought it at the store, had a nice white primed acrylic base on it. I painted oil over the top for like a little value scale. Now I could not go back in with an acrylic or gesso over the top of that. You never wanna put acrylic over oil paint. Um, 
it's, it's just there won't be the chemical bond. This um, this cannot acrylic cannot stick to oil. It'll seemingly stick, and then you'll find that it'll delaminate over time and peel off. Um, but you can do oil over acrylic, so we can you can do a whole acrylic painting. I I have them lying around. I can go get like some of the more abstract ones. You can do a whole one, build it all up in your acrylic, get some nice textures, um, let it dry. It takes 24 hours, and then you can go in with your oil paint and do the fine detail, um, more transparent passages if you want over the top of it. And you've saved a lot of oil paint, which usually is more expensive for the quantity you get. Um, and you've saved a lot of time. Cool tip. We'll talk about that more. Since we have the experience with our acrylic paint from last semester, we can talk about adding texture and getting preliminary studies done um, underneath before diving right into the oil paint. But let's just look at a little bit of the actual differences over here on the palette. Okay, so last semester we had our acrylic paint, if you'll remember. I'm going to put out some, what I would use in the studio. It's going to be slightly warmer but in general, the same kind of value. So this is, we've got our acrylic paint over here, what we used last semester. You've kind of got your traditional oil paint. Um, it's oil paint because it's in oil, linseed oil most often. And then we've got, what we'll be using in this class is water soluble or water mixable uh, oil paint. Right in the middle here. Okay, so one side note is since we're going to be doing a lot of subtle color mixing and skin tone matching, um, we're going to be starting to use palette knives and painting knives. Um, so just like brushes that we covered a little earlier, they have, there's two things to think about when you're looking at like a palette knife or a painting knife. Um, just like the bristles on a brush kind of have their coarseness or softness, palette knives are usually made out of steel. Um, usually has a nice stiff, rigid kind of quality to it, where a painting knife, one that you would actually be more likely to apply paint onto the canvas with, you can see is quite a bit more flexible. Okay, so you can get a, you can kind of control and get the nuance there in your paint application. Both can be used to mix on the palette. Both can be used to apply. Just these are a little bit more delicate of a touch. Also more fragile too. Uh, for this, I'll just be using your regular palette knife. We've got both. The nice thing in class, we'll be using um, the plastic versions, which actually give you quite a bit of flexibility. Okay, so you'll be able to use these to apply paint directly to your canvas if you want to be using more large amounts and create some texture. Now acrylic. You will remember that acrylic is water soluble. So we can just grab a little bit of clean water, thin it out, like so. And it's gonna start to dry, you know, by the end of the video. Well, at least this will all be like completely dry. There'll start to be a skin develop over the top of this and it'll become unusable by end of day. It does clean, you can clean your brushes with the water. You cannot do that same thing with oil paint. Oil paint is going to, you know, oil and water do not mix. So that's when we need these paint thinner, which is odorless. It's not paint thinner as you might think about. It's artist quality, so it's not terrible. Um, but if we had a room of 20 of these jars open, that's going to be an issue. So whereas in my studio, I would have to use this to thin this down. You can kind of hear that I keep a fan going. I've got kind of ventilation, but look at that beautiful transparency that like oil paint offers us where there's more of this kind of opaque quality in the acrylic. We can get beautiful glazes. We can get nice, like vibrant illuminated shadows and stuff. Mm, beautiful. So we want to achieve that same quality, but we don't want to use this harsh stuff over here. So we're going to be using this water soluble paint. I'm just going to not that big a difference, but just grab, I don't know if we want like acrylic mixed in with our water-soluble paint. 
All right, so we can get this nice transparency. And you will notice there is a little bit of difference. Now, just because this is water soluble, the, the way at which it becomes water soluble is through an emulsion process, I believe. But not to worry. Um, it does look cloudy in its appearance when water is added to it because it, there's a chemical reaction there that helps make break it down, which is going to be beneficial to us because it'll mean that we can thin, clean our brushes at the end of class and still be able to use oil paint um, and mix oil paint and clean it up. But that milkiness or that more opaque quality does disappear as the water evaporates in time. So this is just this was like a quick demo I did with this exact same paint and you can see it does have the transparent quality to it that you might get with something like this um, once that evaporates out so no need to worry there we get to use the beautiful qualities of the oil paint without having to worry about the harsh chemical smell of any paint thinners um, and now let's talk about cleaning our brushes okay so this is maybe one of the most important parts um, especially for keeping the school's supply of paintbrushes clean and as new as long as possible. Probably the least fun part, but also just very important. So, what we used last semester were these synthetic brushes. This is the one that I uh, used in the acrylic painting. Okay, so what we did last year, you know, clean in our water. I had you guys rinse them out as much as possible. Um, what is always the case here is... You know, we don't want to jab the brush down. We want to think about the direction of the bristles and try and keep them going in that direction. So if when you're moving across the bottom of the bowl or, or the cleaning vessel, you want to be going with the bristles, not to add extra stress to them. Okay, and then the other thing is, as much as you can, try and get all that oil, or acrylic paint in this case, off into the napkin. And that keeps your water... Uh, cup or bowl as clean as long as possible. Okay, so I'm trying to get most of that out. Now that was almost and then a little bit more agitation there towards the bottom. So after that, what I would have done for you guys, after you rinsed it out as much as you can, is I would have taken a little bit of dish soap um, from, or whatever the school soap we had at hand, and then I would have gone and rinsed them out a little bit further. Um, now I'm going to need your guys' help this semester with making sure, because I just don't think with the amount of oil painting brushes we'll be using that I'll be able to clean them all. So I'm going to need your help keeping them nice and clean. And see, that's sufficient for these brushes that we used last semester. The nylon ones, the ones that last forever, because uh, they're plastic and synthetic, that's good. Call it clean. Now, for the oil painting brushes... They are natural hair brushes, um, and they are rougher, and they they don't get as nice and crisp, crisp and clean as this guy. So they take a little bit more to keep them looking as new as long as possible. So this is the one that we use with the uh, water mixable oil paint. So this is what we'll be using in class, and the same thing applies. You know, try and you know maybe submerge it. But then try and get most of that paint off into your napkin. Again, pulling with the direction of the bristles. And then you can get a little bit more aggressive towards the bottom there, try and work out anything kind of in the belly of the hair of the brush. And that, I mean, the water uh, mixing with the water mixable oil will actually pull quite a bit of it out. And it gets it pretty clean. There is still paint in there, so what I would have you guys do would be go to our sinks at the school. Now I'm just using some Dawn dish soap, that's perfectly fine. Palm olive works great if you're at home and you're using stuff like this. Those are great soaps. Uh, Old Masters paintbrush soap is probably the best. It actually has a built-in conditioner in it. Um, that softens the hairs as you wash it, so that's even better. But these work fine. Or just an, a bar of ivory soap, also great. Um, but you can see I'm not thrashing. I'm definitely using my hand. Don't worry about um, the pigments, especially the ones we're going to be using. 
um, being unhealthy for you. It's We're not using any leads or cadmiums this semester. Um, we're not using traditional oil paint, so we won't be using solvents. Um, the pigments by themselves will not hurt you, and they will not break the skin barrier. So that's not something to worry about. So you can clean it right in your hand. I'm just trying to be careful not to kind of like grind or push against. I'm kind of working back and forth. A little water, and then pulling from the furl out. Now, if it gets down in here where a lot of paint, especially if you're if we're using a lot of paint and it tends to get sucked back into here, um, it's going to be a little bit harder to work out. So one little trick that I wish I knew a lot earlier would be you can actually grab the bristles right here and then kind of move back and forth slightly just to agitate the center of it. And it'll start to pull out any kind of pigment you have left in there. It's hard to see because this is white, but we're getting pretty close to clear water. That's what we're aiming for, just until this runs clear. And that's all it really takes as far as what we're going to be doing at school. That'll be keeping these clean enough. I'll probably go through at the end of the week and just make sure we don't have anything too crazy left over in there. Okay. And then as far as drawing goes... Um, with these brushes that tend to hold a little bit more water, you can pull out as much as you can and kind of reshape the tip of it, looking for that kind of chisel-like quality at the end. And then um, you, I have heard it's bad to lay your brushes like this because you don't want the water to seep down in here and start to dissolve the glue that holds the bristles together. So we can just lay it flat to dry in the classroom or in your studio. Now, since we're here and we have all my supplies, I figured I'd show you guys kind of what I do when finishing a painting session with my brushes. So oil, remember we can't use water. So the solvent or the paint thinner kind of acts as my water. And again, try and get most of that paint right into the napkin because the napkin is a lot cheaper then the paint thinner, just trying to pull as much as I can out. With the paint thinner, I am being a little bit more careful to avoid skin contact. Um, it's not the worst for you, but when you've used it as long and as much as I have, you know, it builds up and adds up over a lifetime. So you gotta be kind of careful. So I'm just trying to work out as much as I can into the napkin before kind of agitating a little bit down in there. That way, I clean this thing a lot less um, than I do. I just can throw these napkins away, right? So overall, it's a time saver. Once you have that, you've kind of stripped the paint. The paint thinner is less like a... Um, it's not going to remove the paint quite like the water-soluble. It kind of just strips it. So it's not good for the hair per se. It definitely gets it clean, and it's definitely better than letting the paint dry in there. But it's not good to let paint thinner sit on the bristles. It'll dry them out. You kind of want to think, since this is a natural hog hair, you kind of want to think of it as natural hair. Um, so once I've done that, I'll use this stuff, and I'll put a little image of it, because I don't have it in the container it came in, but it's called Turpinoid Natural. It's not turpinoid. I'm not even sure if it's natural. Um, but it smells like oranges, so at least it doesn't smell bad. And then what it does is instead of just stripping the paint out, you can see that it's still pulling some of that orangey brown out. Um, it actually grabs onto the pigment and the molecules and it'll leach it out. And so it can get a definite more clean bristle. And then it'll also, it doesn't dry like um, oil does. So it'll actually stay kind of um, wet. And so it'll keep, in a way, it conditions the bristles. So it wouldn't be terrible if this got left on there, but ultimately what I'd want to do is use some of that old master's brush soap or just some nice dish soap just to get off that, because that's technically a cleaner, not something you want to kind of leave sitting on there, just to go get those brushes nice and clean.
again, the whole time kind of shaping where I want these bristles. You're kind of coaching these bristles to keep that direction. Okay. And then lastly, if I'm going away for a weekend or something and I'm not going to be back at my easel with my brushes, um, so they have a some time to sit between the next use, they have this stuff. And this is one of many, but it's a shaper or a restorer. And you just do a thin dip. You could even use like little mini moos. Um, the, I don't know what it's in there, the binder. It'll harden around the outside of this and kind of give shape. It's the same stuff that comes on the bristles when you buy them. You'll notice when you buy a new paintbrush, they're always very stiff and very well formed. And then once you get it in water, it just kind of splays out. So this will help coach these bristles back into where they want to go, keeping it as nice as long as possible. And again, you can either throw it in there or even better, lay it flat to dry. Okay, so big takeaways here are you want to treat your natural hair, natural hair brushes just like your own hair. You want to think about cleaning them, stripping them of any like debris and oil, and then conditioning them. Um, synthetics are a little bit more forgiving. They can just be cleaned and then lay them flat to dry, trying to reshape and recoach where you want these to be, having them last as long as possible. All right. Thank you guys so much. So I hope that was helpful um, as far as brushes go. I know we had some experience with them last semester with the acrylic painting, uh, we're moving into a little bit more coarser brushes this time, but now I hope you understand why we need that coarser bristle brush to apply the heavier bodied oils and then we can still use that soft synthetic synthetic paintbrush for the details and kind of the blending and fine finishing effects um, and they're just kind of a benchmark for oil painting uh, starting with the impressionist and moving forward um, so it's key to use that stuff and I hope the cleaning tips were also helpful um, I know it's going to help me save a lot of time next semester if we can have you guys clean your own brushes after class um i would love to keep you know on with this giving more information a little bit deeper kind of knowledge um we've used canvas paper and um stretch canvas in class but it'd really be cool to talk about the differences in types and like linen versus cotton duck versus paper versus board hard panel uh, what it takes to seal it maybe even stretching um but also, I know it'd be nice for you guys to get your hands dirty a little bit. And while I can't expect you to use paints and paintbrushes, I think the more practice we can get in portraiture, um, drawing, pencil or charcoal, the better. So any portraiture work would be great. I'll post some, if I can somehow link or even I'll post in here the reference folder and I can put some reference images of those master copies I was talking about, the plates that we can copy, just the features in two-tone, um, two-value studies would be great. Or I'll do a quick video on selecting some quality self-portrait reference um, and what to look for moving forward. This doesn't have to be the one we might continue in oil paint once we get back in the studio, but the more practice we get drawing faces at all, but you know, your particular face, the more comfortable you're gonna be able to do, you're gonna be able to do it when you get to it in paint, if that makes sense more practice, the better. Um, so I can go over selecting quality reference for that. And I think that would be a really great, you know, supplementary assignment moving forward. All right, everyone stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll talk to you later.